heave compensation uh, last time. So we we um, saw this uh, we saw this animation of uh, of the passive heave uh, compensation. Let's see if I can get this one on. Uh, which is basically just the hydraulic cylinders that are between the hook on the crane and the load uh, that's on the crane, which is basically, um, let's see if I can get this one on here, <coughs> which is basically just dampening, uh, just like the, the dampeners on a car, so it's just dampening all of the, uh, the oscillating motion. So for some reason it won't work today. Yeah, there. Okay. <coughs> uh, so we were looking at this one uh, last lecture, with the cylinder inside here moving back and forth and sort of counteracting the motion of the waves, so the vertical motion that the, the ship is experiencing from the waves. Uh, and we also uh, one thing you don't get to see from from this one is that. Uh, the really large ones of these uh, often have several cylinders, so, so it's a really huge construction. Uh, so it might have four, five, six cylinders uh, that are working together uh, in order to do this. <coughs> but, but the basic principle is just one cylinder. It de just depends upon uh, either having one massively huge cylinder or having uh, five or six small ones uh, in order to do the, the same function. And then we also looked at the fact that you could end up hitting the eigenfrequency of this passive system because you, you don't have anything controlling the system. The only thing that is controlling the system is the motion of the waves. So that's uh, the only thing that's uh, um, sort of uh, deciding uh, what sort of frequency, uh, frequency it's going to have when it's moving up and down. And the problem is that you can hit the eigenfrequency uh, like happened with the Tacoma Bridge uh, with the wind. So the wind hit the bridge started uh, swaying the bridge a little bit and then it hit the eigenfrequency and it just went wild and in the end it fell apart. Uh, and that can actually happen with a passive heave compensation system like this. So uh, they're, they're in a slightly better situation with a crane lifting something uh, as, the w as opposed to, to the bridge. The bridge was fixed, they couldn't do anything uh, to save the bridge. But uh, when you're uh, operating a crane, you, you can try to do something to, to move it out of this eigenfrequency area. So, so either start uh, pulling up the load or lowering it a little bit faster or maybe trying to move it a bit sideways just to, to get out of this, uh, uh, this uh, particular frequency. So we have some possibilities of, of getting away from it. Now we're going to look a little bit more at Yeah, so, so um, I I if uh, the heave compensation is supposed to stabilize the ship or if it's supposed to stabilize uh, whatever you're lowering down to the load on it. So, so it's definitely stabilizing the load. Uh, so, so the ship is going to move no matter what. But the problem is if you don't have heave compensation, then your load is also going to be moving uh, along with the ship. And then you start getting a problem as soon as, as, soon as your load is lowered underwater you of course suddenly get these uh, hydrodynamic masses, the, the pillows of water that are following, you, following the load around. So up in the air, it's not really a big problem uh, if it's moving up and down along with the ship be because uh, it's probably going to be heavy enough that it's not going to start jumping up and down uh, while it's hanging in the wire. But then when you get it underwater, you add these hydrodynamic cones and they can be huge as we saw when we started calculating them, especially if you start getting some area uh, on, on, on the load that's hanging from the, from the wire. And getting these huge hydrodynamic masses uh, means that you have a really large amount of inertia uh, in the entire mass that you have down there, both the load and the hydrodynamic mass. So there's quite a lot of inertia. So you're going to get a lot of resistance once then your vessel starts moving upwards and your crane boom also starts moving upwards. The load that's hanging from, from the crane boom won't react as quickly be because it's 
uh, has a higher inertia, so it's going to be slow in moving. So you're going to put quite a lot of strain on your crane boom also. So, so it's not just in order to stabilize, uh, stabilize the load and, and keep it uh, fairly in the same position uh, at all times, uh, but it is also to, to minimize the uh, extra stress that you're getting uh, in your crane boom. So, so basically keeping your crane in state also so that it won't break while you're, uh, while you're experiencing uh, large heave motions. Uh, so that's why um, quite a lot of ships have uh, active heave compensation uh, on their uh, crane systems. And I think I had some points here first. And as I've mentioned earlier, you can get up to 90% accuracy uh, for this compensation, which means that if the, if the ship and, and the uh, tip of the crane, uh, if you're experiencing a two meter lift, so two meters of vertical motion on, on, the, on the tip of the crane, with a 90% accuracy, with a heave compensation, you're only going to experience 20 centimeters of vertical motion on, on the uh, load. Uh, and that means that, that you're not going to be transferring that much forces I into the crane boom uh, from, the, from all of the mass that you have uh, down here. <coughs> yes, so two meter heave motion reduced to 20 centimeters. And they use a lot of sensors uh, as I talked about uh, last time. So motion reference units uh, that register motion and acceleration, much like the accelerometers in a smartphone. So, so they're basically just uh, do doing the same technology only a bit more accurately than uh, what's in your smartphone. Your smartphone is fairly accurate uh, when it's registering it, but it doesn't always, uh, it doesn't always interpret the signals uh, it's getting. So, uh, uh, usually, when I'm uh, when I'm uh, standing around here uh, doing lectures, my smartphone thinks that I'm sitting uh, because I'm not moving around all that much. So, so uh, mostly, I'm just standing still. Uh, the same, same like I have uh, uh, an activity sensor on my watch. So if I'm uh, standing at a desk and I'm working with a computer, so I'm standing, uh, my clock is supposed to be able to uh, to know if I'm standing or if I'm sitting. But since my arms are in the same position as if I was sitting, it thinks that I'm sitting. So, so it's easy to, 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 to sort of fool these sensors that we have uh, on our persons, but it's a bit more difficult to fool the sensors uh, that they're using in the uh, heave compensation systems because they are more fine-tuned to, to what kinds of motion they are supposed to react to. So uh, they're, they're pretty, pretty sensitive systems. And uh, the data uh, gathered from these sensors, it's processed in onboard computers, and then it's fed into the hydraulic system. Uh, and the hydraulic system could be either uh, uh, connected to, to the winch in the crane itself, so could be connected to the winch system on, on the crane, uh, and basically just telling it to either pay out more wire or pull in more wire just to compensate for the motion. But it could also uh, be connected to a cylinder, so so not uh, necessarily a cylinder hanging from the uh, from the crane hook li like the passive heave one, but it could actually be connected to uh, a cylinder that will be lifting the entire crane up and down. So uh, cylinders like that are really huge. They're like you could crawl inside them easily. Uh, they're they're pretty massive uh, when you see them, uh, and they're more in use uh, on on rigs. And stuff like that on, on rig decks with uh, risers that are coming up from uh, from the uh, uh, subsea templates um, and trying to, to compensate for the heave motion there. They have these huge cylinders that are basically doing this uh, because the risers are directly connected. Um, they're not hanging from a, from a wire, uh, so they have to do it by by hydraulic cylinders basically. So I don't think I had uh, yeah I had one more. Uh, and then the, uh, with the uh, data that is processed in the computer and it's being sent to the hydraulic system and the hydraulic system then activates and then starts to counter the heave motions. So we can see this uh, short clip here.
have a cylinder that's linear on the uh, deck, you can also have it connected to the winch. fairly short one but it uh, shows more or less how, how it's working with uh, with winches pulling in and uh, paying out wires yeah uh, what's the difference between uh, the, the main difference is that uh, the active one I is um, uh, it needs to have sensors so so the active one needs to register what's going on uh, and and the active one can reach uh, as we said, up to 90% uh, 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 compensation. Uh, while the passive one, uh, it is just influenced by the motion. So, so it's just reacting to the motion. So, so it's basically, uh, uh, basically the same as the dampening system that's uh, in a car. Like all, uh, by all four wheels in, in a car, you have springs that are attached to it. But if you didn't have a dampening system, as soon as you drove over a bump in the road, your car would be going like this forever afterwards. So it would just be bumping along. So you also have uh, hydraulic cylinders that are uh, dampening this motion. So uh, basically, uh, the spring would, would have been moving like this without the dampener. But as soon as you get uh, this uh, um, uh, hydraulic cylinder connected into the same part, it uh, creates some resistance uh, as the uh, spring is going up and down. And then this resistance is sort of eating up the energy uh, that the spring has. So for, for every pass, uh, for every compression of the spring, it doesn't manage to decompress as far, so that you get less and less uh, a spring motion from it. And basically, uh, the waves here are doing the same as the springs. So the waves are moving up and down, uh, and then you have the uh, passive heat compensation system, which is just dampening this motion. But it can't dampen the motion for the entire vessel, but it can dampen the motion for, for the load that's hanging uh, from the wire. So basically, uh, if we're going to pull the analogy for, for the car again, the load hanging from the wire would be the equivalent of inside the car where we're sitting, and, and the vessel would be like the, uh, the car tires. So, so they're the ones that's directly connected, and they're bumping around and moving quite a lot, while, uh, while inside the car feels pretty, uh, pretty safe while we're sitting there or not bumping that much. Uh, one other thing that we need to think about when we're talking about offshore operations is, of course, the weather. So I've been talking about the weather on and off uh, as we've uh, gone through uh, this part and other parts also. And now we're going to get into what maximum significant wave height is. Uh, and uh, it is usually uh, the parameter that's being used to define uh, the uh, weather that is allowed during an operation. So how much, how much weather is allowed. <coughs> and we also need to define a minimum length of weather window. So basically we need to put our uh, feet on the ground and think realistically how many hours do we need in order to complete this operation. Uh, even accounting for uh, possible hang-ups. So, so if something goes wrong and we have to fix that also, we have to take this into account when we're th thinking about the minimum length uh, of, uh, of the operation. Uh, and this will then be translated into a, uh, what's called a weather window, which basically means that <coughs> we need to talk with the, uh, uh, to the meteorologists and uh, listen to them with what kind of forecast do we have for the weather? If we have a forecast that in, in uh, 10 hours, there will be uh, much heavier winds coming into your area. 
so uh, you're going to be uh, starting to experience at least a lot of wind load to, mm, to begin with, and then the wind is going to start whipping up waves, and you're going to get waves also. So that's going to happen in 10 hours. And we know that we need, uh, for an example, eight hours to finish this operation. Uh, and then we've even put in some extra time in case something goes wrong. So then we know that we have an eight hour weather window, but in reality we have 10 hours until the weather is going to be uh, much worse. So then we can start doing our operation. And then we have to really start moving because uh, we uh, preferably we would like to be finished before eight hours uh, had passed, just to be on the safe side. So that's what a, what a weather window uh, basically means. <coughs> and then the significant uh, wave height, the average is the tallest third of the measured individual wave heights during 20 minutes. So you do a time period of 20 minutes where you're measuring uh, the height of each wave, each individual wave is being measured. And then you do the math so, so we exclude the bottom two-thirds, so the, the, the lowest two-thirds of the uh, waves, and then you look at the, uh, the tallest third, and then you do the average uh, height of those. Which also means that you can have, uh, have a maximum wave height that can be two times as much as the significant wave height. So if you have an operation, uh, you have uh, set that your uh, maximum significant wave height should be six meters, for example, in order to do this operation. Usually, so long as you have a, a active heave compensation system, a uh, uh, six meter uh, significant wave height should be okay uh, in order to, uh, to perform your operation. But it does mean that you might be experiencing waves that are 12 meters, not six meters. So, so the, the very tallest of the waves that are going to hit you every now and then, they don't come that often, but every now and then a really tall wave is going to come and it might be 12 meters. So, so uh, it's going to be, be a rough hit with that one wave, which is really big, but uh, overall the average, uh, your heave uh, systems are going to be able to handle everything. So um, uh, there was actually I can't remember how if it was one or two years ago, but there was a was a really serious accident on on a rig uh, some while back, and that was a ten meter wave. So a ten meter wave managed to hit uh, the windows on the side of a rig, and there was some construction failure or something. So so the windows just broke, and there were people in, uh, right inside there. So there was at least one death, I think it was uh, in that one. And that was just a ten meter wave that managed to hit the side of the rig. So so uh, a twelve meter wave that's that's pretty intense when you get it then. And in the really, really heavy storms, hurricane type storms, you, you can get 20, 25 meter waves out in the North Sea. So it's pretty, pretty intense wh when you start getting these kinds of waves. Like uh, uh, if you remember the, the diving vessel that we were looking at, that was uh, 23 or 24 meters wide. So you can get waves that are taller than the width of the ship. So that's, Pretty, uh, pretty heavy when you're out there in, in, in the sea. <coughs> uh, and then we're going to look at a small uh, weather statistics example, which is from the Gulfax and uh, Statfjord area of the North Sea. So those are, are two, two fields that are pretty close to each other. And here we get a typical uh, weather statistics, which is basically giving us uh, the availability uh, in percentage of time, which basically means how much, uh, how much of the time during one specific month can we experience less than two meters of significant wave height? Well, in January, only 5% of the month is going to have less than two meters. Then we move down into May, June, July, so more than half of the month is going to have uh, that, that small waves, so fairly calm waters during the, the summer months. And then we're uh, getting back into the, the sum, uh, winter months and we are getting uh, uh, pretty few days with, uh, with uh, this small wave. So a couple of days each month where you have, have very small waves. If you go up to four meter significant wave height, then you can see in, in the summer months, June, July, August, we're almost at 100%. So if you have 
a heave compensation system that can handle four meter significant wave height. Then you can see more or less from, from uh, the beginning of April and to, uh, well, uh, October, November, you're going to have uh, a pretty good uh, chance of doing your operation almost no matter what while you're, uh, while you're offshore. But then as you hit, hit the winter months again, there's a, a basically a 50-50 uh, chance that the weather is going to be too bad uh, to, uh, to perform the operation which would mean that you would uh, basically just have to sit around and wait until the weather improved itself enough to be able to do the operation. And that's going to cost money, which is also why uh, offshore operas operations are usually run in seasons so, so that they run them during the summer months. So, uh, so uh, over at the deep ocean headquarters, you're going to walk past it uh, when you're going to the SIMSI uh, course uh, next week. Uh, so when you're walking over there, walking past deep ocean. If you're going past there in the summer months, there's usually always quite a lot of people working overtime because that's in the middle of their uh, most hectic period doing operations uh, offshore. Uh, and there's usually always something going wrong so that people onshore have to try to figure out a solution to whatever went wrong. So th then they're always working. Uh, then so, um, uh, and uh, on top of all of that, that's the months where they have to do their summer vaca vacation, so they have less people at work also. So it's going to be extra hectic for whoever is at work uh, at that time. So yeah, um, and that also means like companies uh, like Imenko, where I was working, come uh, February, March, April, uh, then you suddenly get these frantic calls. Oh shit, we really need this equipment. We had forgotten to, to order it uh, when we were planning the operation in uh, November, December. So, so, and then they had forgotten to order uh, the equipment uh, or they thought they had the equipment in a warehouse, but they didn't anyway. So they didn't actually check that they had it there. They just thought they had it available. And then all of a sudden you get these frantic calls uh, when the summer is approaching fast and, uh, and uh, they really need this equipment now. And uh, usually when you're manufacturing equipment, uh, unless you're really lucky and you actually have that equipment in your warehouse ready to just deliver it to your customer. If you have to manufacture it, you usually have to think about like six, eight, 12 weeks in manufacturing time. So, so uh, then when you suddenly get, get these calls and they're going to perform an operation in four weeks and you know that usually you have to have at least eight weeks in order to, uh, to manufacture this, then you sort of have to start talking to your suppliers. Well. Can you do a 24-hour shift? <laughs> is that a possibility? Our customer is actually willing to pay for it so because they really need this uh, equipment. So you, you can end up in situations like that. So, um, so I've, I've worked overtime myself uh, just getting things ready. Uh, uh, in that case, it was getting, uh, getting the technical drawings ready so that we could send them to the manufacturing uh, uh, workshop so that they could work 24 hours a day in order to get it out uh, in three weeks instead of the usual eight. So it was, um, it was pretty hefty uh, when you start getting into those uh, situations. I think it's been a bit calmer these past two years uh, with regards to the uh, oil market being uh, a bit less, a bit less uh, hectic uh, than it has been. Uh, but um, I think they're still ending up in these situations uh, basically because um, what's happening now is that they've, they've uh, laid off so many people in many of the companies that uh, the people that are left are usually overworked. So, so they, they don't always have the capacity to do uh, their own work and their colleague who was laid off's work. So, so they can't do all of the work tasks. So every now and then they forget to do something and then you end up with situations where you have to basically have to pay your way out of it by paying overtime and uh, doing stuff like that. So. It can be uh, very, uh, very uh, ineffective uh, trying to do things effectively. <laughs> We're going to do uh, a couple of examples here, looking at necessary cabin space. Uh, like the diving vessels that we uh, were looking at uh, in the appendix for the diving part, uh, the diving vessel itself had cabin space for 120 people uh, on it. Uh, the pipe laying uh, vessel, which we saw the first couple of slides of, uh, that had room for 400 people. So, so 
sort of just to, to show the, the difference in, uh, in uh, vessels, how, uh, how much of a difference there can be. Uh, you can have even larger differences than that also, but now we're going to look at an example of how much people you're actually going to need for an operation. So in this case, it's an uh, IMR operation, so inspection, maintenance, and repair. Uh, and it's uh, going to include replacement of a module on a subsea production system. But they're only going to use ROVs when they're uh, doing the subsea work. So it means that we're going to need maritime personnel. So that's the personnel uh, running the vessel. So, so they're not really included in the, uh, in the offshore operation per se. Their job is to run the vessel. So, so it's, it's the captain and the machinists and every, uh, everyone that's working to, to keep the vessel going. And there's 18 of them on this particular vessel. Then we're going to need uh, ROV pilots and uh, other personnel, so technicians and everything like that. And we have two work ROVs and one observation ROV uh, on this vessel. So that means that we need 11 people running this. Because usually, uh, we've talked about divers. We run them in shifts often so that we, we have uh, continually uh, divers down uh, some sea doing work. Uh, and it's the same with the ROVs, so that if if the pilot has been, uh, if the ROV pilot is reaching the end of his shift, but they're not done doing the work there, they're just going to switch pilots, and another pilot is going to take over. So that's why they have uh, need 11 people uh, to do this. Then they have deck personnel, so that's for for more the module handling system, so so uh, doing uh, all of the shifting around of equipment on deck. So six people uh, to work there. Then we have uh, project personnel, and this is where, uh, where uh, you guys would come in uh, in this situation. So uh, as an engineer or an offshore manager uh, is most likely where you would, uh, uh, would be. So uh, there's three of those in this case. And then we have specialists for running uh, the tools and, and the module, six of those as well. And even... Uh, um, specific operators for the module handling system. Two of those to run the module handling system. Then the client or customer shows up to have some observ uh, observation and stuff. So four guys from, uh, from the uh, guys or women. There, there are plenty of women working uh, around there also. So four persons showing up from, uh, from the customer uh, which wants to keep an eye on everything. And then one observer that's uh, in from, for an example, DMD or, or something like that to check out the operation. So then we end up with 51 uh, persons on that vessel. So, and that's just, just uh, an ROV uh, operation offshore. So the next one we're going to look at uh, is going to be a pipeline repair, including hyperbaric welding, and it's divers that's performing the hyperbaric welding. So then we have, again, maritime personnel, but this time we're including deck personnel and riggers in that one, so we get 32 in all uh, running the vessel. So, so deck personnel and riggers, that they're handling the, uh, the anchor systems and uh, all of the, the regular stuff on deck uh, for that one. Then we have uh, ROV personnel, because even though we're doing this with, uh, with divers, we're, we're still going to have ROVs there uh, able to, uh, to assist the divers. So we have uh, the same 11 people that we had in the, in the previous example. Then we have divers and diving support personnel, so 35 in all. So exactly how many of these are divers and how many of them are support personnel is a bit difficult to say from this, uh, this particular one, but they've just lumped everyone in, in, into one, uh, one uh, category. We have operators and technicians for the hyperbaric welding system itself. So uh, they have a fairly fairly short job wh while they're out there because they only need to work exactly when they're doing the uh, the welding. So so, <laughs> so they don't, don't really have that much to do. So there's a lot of waiting around for those eleven guys. I could uh, imagine. And uh, then we have again project personnel. So most likely you would end up in that category if you were joining an uh, offshore operation like this. Six uh, of the project personnel. Specialists. It says there. So that might be just people with a lot of experience from, from this sort of, uh, sort of operation with hyperbaric welding or 
it might be due to some uh, uh, particular equi equipment that's being brought along or, or something like that. So, but at least four specialists in this case. Six uh, persons from customer uh, and also uh, including observer. So all in all, you suddenly get 105 persons for that one. Yeah. Uh, for project uh, project personnel, uh, engineers and offshore managers, I have, I've never been offshore myself uh, in a role like that. But, but for I know for the engineers part, they're basically there if something goes wrong, either with uh, ROV, uh, with the diving system, or with the uh, hyperbaric welding system. So they're there to to solve problems if something happens. Uh, so, so they're also there to to perform uh, sort of. Uh, not managerial tasks, but uh, sort of ad administer the systems a little bit. So, so keep an eye on everything, that everything is being used uh, correctly and so on. But they're, they're also there as uh, as backup, basically. If, if something serious happens, uh, they're the ones that are supposed to be able to come up with solutions uh, while they're offshore. So, uh, and uh, and it, it's pretty amazing that, that there's quite a lot of solutions that have been created offshore that have ended up being brought back back to uh, back to land and then uh, sort of being transferred into a finished product because they've they've created they've ended up uh, with a problem offshore they've created a solution for that problem and then they see that mm, this is a pretty good solution so they bring it back to their headquarters for an example deep ocean headquarters and they look at it and see that well this problem can happen more than once so uh, it would be nice to have this uh, this tool ready uh, if it happens another time so then they start uh, manufacturing the, uh, the tool and uh, uh, keeping it in their warehouses to, and maybe even on their vessels to, to have them in stock. So, so there's quite a lot of stuff going on there also. But, but uh, it's not really a, you're not just sitting, sitting behind a computer uh, at your desk. Uh, you're really there. You're, you're wearing overalls. You're on the deck. You're working. So, so you're, you're getting dirty. So it's, uh, it's more of a physical job uh, when you're an offshore engineer compared to if you're uh, purely uh, stationed at um, at uh, onshore desk job. So the nice thing is with uh, companies like Deep Ocean and, and uh, Reef Subsea and stuff who do uh, these sorts of operations, they uh, often prefer that uh, people that they have employed, engineers that are going supposed to be sitting in offices uh, in their headquarters or, or in some other office building, uh, they often prefer that uh, every now and then that they actually go offshore and do an operation. So maybe once a year, maybe once every other year, maybe even more than once a year, two or three times a year, if, if they so wish. They, can, they usually have lists where, where their employees can uh, write their names on, saying that, well, it would be uh, in, uh, for example, September. Uh, it fits, fits uh, well into my schedule if I uh, do an offshore uh, uh, operation then. And then you're uh, planned in and you're sent offshore. Because to them, it's very important that people keep fresh experiences in their minds so, so that even though you're usually sitting and working at the desk, it is very nice to every now and then refresh your experience of being on a ship and what's happening on a ship so that you know when you're getting a phone call from one of the engineers or offshore managers or maybe even just technicians out there, I really have a problem now. I need to, uh, to get some help with it. Uh, then you know exactly what they're talking about because you've been there. You, you've been in their shoes, so you know uh, you know the jargon that they're using when they're talking, and, and you, you've been there, you've actually seen the stuff that they're talking about. You maybe even handled it yourself, uh, so, so that it's a lot easier to, to relate to, to the problems that are being presented to you in order to be able to, to solve them. Uh, the, the diving support uh, personnel, the, they, they are uh, uh, only working w with the divers, basically. So, so they're working with the control system of the, of the, uh, of the diving uh, system. So, so they're making sure that, that the divers are kept alive, basically, so, so that the pressure is okay, that they're getting enough oxygen, not too much oxygen, just, just the perfect amount of oxygen in the breathing gas and, and everything like that. So, so they're just they're keeping a constant watch on, on, their, uh, on their divers. And that's a, uh, it's a full-time job, basically, being, being uh, uh, diving support personnel. While the, while the project personnel, they are more, uh, more in for the operation itself, 
So, so they're there because they're going to perform the work test. They're going to do hyperbaric welding. So not because it's divers that uh, are going to perform the uh, hyperbaric welding. The project personnel would still be there even though they use the remote welding uh, version of it so that it was uh, done uh, remote controlled. So uh, the project personnel would be there anyway. And then the offshore managers, I'm not quite sure about their role, but I think they have more of a uh, administrative task uh, on, the, uh, on the vessel. So they're sort of keeping an uh, overview over what's going on and, and making sure that everyone is doing their job and that everything is uh, going according to schedule. So, so it's uh, more of a, it, it, it's straight off a manager role uh, when they're there. So that was just two examples just to show we had one with 105 uh, persons uh, doing a fairly uh, fairly similar job to, to the others here with 51. So of course it wasn't the same kind of job. The one with 51 uh, persons on uh, was a module replacement and the one with 105 was of course hyperbaric welding. So it's slightly different operations but, but still they're fairly massive offshore operations so, uh, so that uh, just the point where you're getting 35 people in connection with the diving uh, stuff. If this was going to be remote controlled, you would probably have um, a couple of more specialists connected to the uh, to the welding system. We still have the 11 ones, so maybe maybe 15, 16 uh, connected to the welding system, and then none of the diving personnel there. So you would have quite a lot less personnel on the ship if you were doing it uh, remote controlled. So it just shows a little bit uh, why diving ends up becoming so much more expensive than using a uh, remote system. But of course, every now and then we really do have to use divers. So let's see. Um, the uh, last, I think this is the last part. Uh, we're going to look at is basically just the, the pros and cons of using a semi-submersible versus a single hull vessel. So the advantages that we get if we use the semi-submersible is that we have a more advantageous characteristic uh, with regards to the motion of the waves and we can use a semi-submersible rig uh, more all year around, basically because <coughs> it doesn't really, it doesn't get all that much affected by, by the heat motions uh, as a single hull vessel would be. <coughs> so, so that even though uh, we get much larger waves in the winter months, you might still be able to, to do, do the operation from a, uh, uh, from a semi-submersible. And they usually have a large and open uh, deck which is very practical with regards to uh, both moving stuff around and doing work on deck because you have a lot of uh, space uh, to do it. And they are usually well equipped with uh, regards to cranes and have very uh, strong cranes usually so they can lift heavy loads, usually more than one. We'll do the disadvantages after the break.
Right. <clears throat> so we'll look at the disadvantages of the semi-submersible. Uh, they have a relatively low transit speed, so they uh, they use quite a lot of tra uh, travel time getting from one field to another. So that's of course going to be be one of the uh, disadvantages uh, with using them. So that uh, if you're going to <coughs> Uh, if you have one semi-submersible that is working uh, maybe on, on the Goliath uh, platform in the area up in the Barents Sea, so way up north to the north of Norway, uh, and then you want it to come down here right outside of Haugesund and do some work, then it's going to take quite a lot of time to travel all the way along the coast of Norway in order to get down there, while a single hull vessel would have uh, done, done the trip in uh, a considerably shorter amount of time. They're also very large and deep going, uh, which gives them quite a lot of restrictions with uh, regards to access to docks or harbors or even uh, uh, to getting close enough to rigs so that if they're going to do, do work on, on a platform uh, and the platform's legs are sort of sloping outwards, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get the, uh, the semi-submersible close enough because it's going so deep into the water. They also have a limited load capacity. You would have uh, thought that since they have uh, very powerful cranes and can lift very heavy loads, that they could also load quite a lot. But this is because of they, uh, when they are moving, uh, they are of course raising themselves up out of the water. So, so they get quite high up, so the center of gravity ends up quite uh, far above the uh, ocean surface, which means that they get quite a lot of uh, tipping motions going on uh, and they get uh, very low stability I if they have too much heavy load uh, on them. So, so they're, not that, they're not that well equipped to transport heavy loads. They can handle heavy loads with their cranes and work a lot with them and if they are at the field where they're supposed to be working and they have submerged them themselves in order to, uh, to get, uh, uh, get a better characteristic uh, with regards to the motion of the waves so, so that they're not getting all of this heave motion. They can easily use their cranes to lift heavy stuff off of another vessel. So a single hull vessel that has been transporting the heavy stuff over there. So then they can lift it off and over onto their own deck, do some work on it, and then lower it down. So that's usually how it works. So uh, both the fact that they have trouble getting into uh, all of the harbors and docks in order to load uh, heavy stuff onto uh, their uh, uh, the semi-submersible vessel, and also that they have trouble transporting it means that they usually, uh, usually just transport themselves to the working location, and then another vessel comes in with, uh, with uh, whatever it is that they're going to work with. Uh, which, of course, again adds to the cost of using a semi-submersible. So that they they are uh, they have their advantages with regards to, especially with regards to work during winter months and and uh, bad weather. Uh, but they also have quite a lot of disadvantages. So so. Uh, Usually, it is more cost-effective uh, choosing a single hull, hull vessel for, for an operation because the single hull vessel can usually do everything by itself uh, unless, of course, the weather is too bad. Uh, then you will have to get a rig in uh, to do it if it has to be done right then. Uh, preferably, if you could, you would just postpone the operation a couple of months until the weather improves itself so that you could still use a, a single hull vessel. But then at other times, there won't be any single hull vessels available uh, to do this work so that you actually have to use a semi-submersible. Uh, then you'll just have to, have to suffer the costs of it when, <laughs> when you're going to do use it. <coughs> the, there's also a problem with uh, having a great distance from the deck level and down to the ocean surface, which means that whatever is hanging from your lifting wire is going to get the chance to uh, to uh, experience quite a lot of pendulum motions so swinging back and forwards while it's being lowered down. Basically just because it's starting from a much higher vantage point, so it has quite a lot further uh, to go before it hits the water. And it also uh, has, uh, uh, since the tip of the crane is much further up, so small motions uh, on, on the, uh, uh, the semi-submersible is going to make the tip of the crane have fairly large uh, motions so that that's going to add to the, the uh, pendulum uh, experience of, of load. But as soon 
soon as you get it down to the, the surface and you hit the water, it's of course going to be covered with the hydrodynamic mass, so then it's going to not going to uh, keep swinging back and forth because uh, the water will basically just dampen all of that. But it could be a problem getting it down there. If you get really heavy uh, pendulum motions on it, you wouldn't want, want it to be swinging back and forth as you hit uh, the water surface because then you're basically just smacking it into the water. Uh, so you're going to potentially damage it uh, by doing that. And uh, as I've already said, a relatively high day rate, that they're pretty expensive uh, using them, so uh, usually more cost efficient with a single hull vessel. So when we get to Appendix B, we are going to be looking a bit more closely at motions of vessel and crane. Um, so it's uh, sort of similar to the Appendix C that we've already looked at uh, with regards to the calculations you did in your submission, but this is more just looking at at uh, how the wave motions affect uh, the crane tip and also the how it will affect the crane depending on the location of the crane on, on the ship. So we're going to look at that uh, quite a bit. Also a little bit at how waves work. <coughs> so then we can have a quick look at regulations and uh, lifting dynami dynamics and hydrodynamics. And this is just uh, listing basically different regulations and uh, I don't think there are any recommended practices in here, just uh, operating standards. Um, so we have, with regards to hydrodynamics and lifting dynamics, you will find uh, some rules in the design of offshore steel structures in general. So there are some rules there with, uh, that we will have to, have to follow if you're going to design something uh, uh, that's going to be used in a lifting operations. You also have marine operations, design and fabrication. It's also going to list quite a lot of uh, requirements uh, for whatever it is that you're designing. You have fabrication and testing of offshore structures. Again, uh, a lot of requirements. You have marine operations in general. You have uh, load transfer operations. So that would be uh, with regards to if you have a semi-submersible ready to do work, and then you have a single hull vessel coming in with whatever it is that the semi-submersible is doing work on, when it's lifting it from the uh, single hull vessel and over onto the semi-submersible, that's a load transfer operation. <coughs> so you're basically just moving something from one vessel to another. Uh, then you are doing a load transfer. <coughs> You, you can also have load transfers happen between cranes so that you have one crane taking over the load from, from another crane. So, so there are many ways of uh, doing load transfers, but mainly it is from one vessel to another or from one vessel and onto a platform. Uh, that could also be. Sea transports, there are rules for that. Transit and positioning of mobile offshore units, also rules. That will be more with regards to planning an offshore operation, not directly designing some, uh, some gear uh, that's going to be used. And offshore installation operations, again, uh, with regards to planning it uh, when it's going to be done. And then lifting operations with regards to how uh, things are going to be lifted uh, is mo mostly connected to the planning of the lifting operation, but if I remember correctly, it does also uh, stipulate some requirements to, to lifting equipment. So for an example, if, if the uh, lifting equipment that you are, uh, you are creating in your team projects in, in mechanical design, if that was supposed to be used on a vessel, then you would have to uh, refer to this one and see if there was anything you had to take into consideration when you were doing your designs. Then we have uh, subsea operations. Uh, which, of course, uh, as soon as you're lowering something underneath uh, the surface of the water, uh, then you need to think about what's uh, being required by, by this uh, regulation. Then you have standards for certification of lifting appliances, and this one would be directly linked to your uh, mechanical design project uh, if, uh, if it was supposed to be used on a vessel. <coughs> And you have an ISO standard for marine operations. 
and you have uh, NOSOC for lifting equipment, which would also be directly connected uh, if your uh, projects were used on vessels. And you also have a NOSOC with safe use of lifting equipment, which is more like uh, the, the requirements on how you are going to, to uh, operate the equipment, not necessarily the design of it. So you can see there's quite a lot of DNVs up here, uh, and all of the DNV ones are free, uh, so you can download the PDF from, from their web page, and you can uh, look through it if you, if you need to. Uh, most likely, if any of you are going to write a bachelor's uh, your bachelor's project uh, with regards to, uh, to oil and gas industry offshore, uh, you're going to have to be referencing quite a lot of the DNV regulations. Uh, if you're doing something onshore, it's probably going to be some ISO standards or, or the machine directive or, or something like that. Uh, you're going to have to reference uh, rules and regulations anyway, but uh, the nice thing with the DNV ones is that they are they are free of use, uh, so, so you can you can uh, use them as you want. Uh, the NOSOC ones, uh, I know there's a couple of those that are still free uh, to use, uh, but quite a lot of them have now become uh, 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 payment options, so you have to pay in order to, to see them. That being said, I think actually the... Um, the uh, library here uh, can uh, uh, has a, uh, a sort of uh, uh, subscription type w where you can get to view uh, view the ones that you have to pay for. Uh, so you can view them on the computer. You can't do they're, they're sort of copyright protected, so you can't do uh, screenshots or anything of them. So, so you can't really print anything from them, uh, but you can view them and read and, and uh, write down uh, the information that you need. So, so that's a possibility uh, in, a, in a bachelor's uh, project when you're doing that, uh, instead of having to, uh, to uh, use uh, money on it. Most likely also you will be working with, uh, with a company, uh, uh, because usually it's a, it's a cooperation between a company, the school, and uh, your uh, student group. So uh, hopefully then the, the company will have uh, either a paper or an electronic version of, of whatever uh, regulations that you need to follow when you're working on it. But uh, if you just want a quick peek at seeing how they look like, uh, just going into the DNV system and downloading a couple of them and just skimming quickly through them uh, might be a nice way of just getting to know the system a little bit because uh, it does take a little bit of knowing b because uh, it's written slightly differently from textbooks. Uh, wh when you get familiar with using uh, standards like this, you will see that there are a lot of parallels to a textbook. They're basically telling you how to do stuff, just like a textbook does. Uh, but they write it in a sort of roundabout manner so that you have to be able to sort of cut through the bullshit and, <laughs> and get, to the, uh, get to the point so, so that you get the, uh, know what's important to you and, and the project that you are doing. So that was just a quick one uh, for those. Uh, we will be looking in part six. There is quite a lot more about uh, uh, health, safety, environment, rules, regulation, laws, uh, everything like that. So uh, we're going to start looking at that when we're done with the appendixes uh, for this one. So we'll, I think we will manage to do the appendix A today for part five. And Appendix A is just uh, similar to Appendix A of the, uh, of the uh, diving part. So we're going to go through data sheets for different vessels. So we're just going to look at options of uh, different vessels. The first one we'll look at is Edda Fauna, uh, which I believe is one of the deep ocean ships. Yeah, it says deep ocean up here, so <laughs> it's a deep ocean ship. So it's an uh, inspection, maintenance, and repair vessel. And they started using it in 2008. Actually, the flagship of their fleet. I'm uh, not quite sure if that is true nowadays, or if they've gotten uh, another larger ship recently. That, that might be. Uh, but at least it was true when, uh, when this data sheet was created. 
and uh, as you can see here, designed with special emphasis on providing excellent safety and work conditions. So they're sort of bragging uh, a little bit about uh, what they've done. <laughs> that, that, that's typical in a data sheet, you have to brag a little bit. <coughs> uh, and they have a closed deck hanger. So, th so that's a nice thing to, to have on your ship. So think about your, if, if you're going to do some repair work on equipment or tools or anything like that uh, while you're on the ship, uh, and if it doesn't have a closed deck hanger, uh, which basically means that you can be indoors when you're doing the work. Uh, if it doesn't have that, you're going to have to stay outdoors, whether it's raining or blowing uh, loads of wind, snowing maybe, and you have to stay on deck in order to be able to do your repair work. So, so uh, having the possibility of having this closed hangar uh, on deck there, that's, uh, that has to be a, a very nice, nice perk for, uh, for, um, uh, for the people that are working on that ship. <coughs> And they have accommodation and office facilities with very high standards. Uh, of course, if you see, if you see a lot of uh, pictures from uh, from vessels and stuff like that, it uh, it's not always all that far off from a cruise ship. Often, when you look at their their uh, cabins and stuff like that, they they, they usually have fairly uh, much luxury when they're on on the vessels. Um, not quite the uh, cruise ship. <laughs> level but but, uh, but 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 it's not uh, it doesn't look like uh, a, a, um, a a container ship from the 1960s where everything was steel and uh, you were basically just you were there because you were working there you weren't supposed to be living while you were on the ship you were just supposed to be working so it was a quite a di uh, a very different uh, perspective on things uh, back then um yeah, they are creating good working environment for offshore crew and clients. And that has something to do with the high standards they put I in their cabins and stuff, because of course, if, uh, if your crew is uh, sort of, they're happy when they're uh, on, on their ship, they're going to do good work. If, they're, if, if they sort of get the feeling that they're only there to do work, they, they aren't allowed to, to do any relaxation when their ship's over or anything like that. The only thing they can do is to crawl into their bunk in a very sad room and, and just basically sleep until they have to go to work again. They're not going to be very happy no, when they're working. So, uh, so if they can get some luxuries, they're, they're going to uh, do better jobs. And they're also going to be more rested uh, when they get come on to the next shift to, to do work because they're going to sleep better and, and everything like that. So it's, um, it's sort of a uh, uh, looking at the whole system approach, not just looking at the work side of it, but looking at, um, uh, at uh, all of the aspects of it. <coughs> so we can see some of the key vessel features here also. Uh, ROV support vessel and subsea inspection maintenance and the repairs. So it has a de-ice notation. It has covered lifeboats. Uh, and also bow area and hangar area. So the de-ice notation means that it, it can travel in uh, areas where, uh, where um, in, in the winter months it's going to experience ice. Uh, so which means that even though, even though the sea itself isn't covered in ice, so, so it's, not a, it's not an icebreaker, it can't, can't go up to the, uh, the Arctic ice and start uh, carving its way into the uh, ice sheets up there. That's not what de-ice means. It means that uh, you get a lot of uh, water spray from waves and everything. So, so you, when you're out at sea, everything is usually wet. When you're outside uh, on, on the boat, on the deck and everything, everything is going to be wet. Uh, and the problem is when it gets cold enough, that water is going to freeze. So they have de-icing uh, systems on, on the ship so that it's not going to be covered in a, a in ice, basically, while they're moving around. Maybe you've seen it, if any of you have uh, seen the Discovery Channel, uh, they have the, these, I um, can't remember what they're called, but uh, these uh, uh, different fishing uh, vessels that are fishing these uh, huge crabs uh, outside of Alaska, so, so extreme fishing or something like that. And sometimes when you see from, from uh, January, February up there, uh, they're, they've been out with their boats and it's like, massive ice everywhere on, 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 the, on their fishing boat. So it's just like covered in white ice everywhere. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty amazing that they can do work at all well, when they're uh, in such conditions. So uh, it would be nice having a, a large ship to uh, have the ability to, to get rid of all of that ice. Uh, it 
has a 60 ton module handling system, so it can handle modules up to 60 ton, so fairly large modules. And the uh, operations of the module handling system is in the enclosed hangar area. So we can see it uh, sort of there. You can't see the module handling system behind here because it's inside this part. So that's sort of a, a, a nice thing, uh, having it covered over like that. Uh, the skidding system uh, in relation to the module handling system is uh, those are the rails basically on the deck to move the modules back and forth, the skidding system. Uh, so th they can also handle 60 ton modules. So it would have been pretty idiotic to, uh, to have a skidding system for 50 ton modules if the handling system could, could do 60 tons. So <laughs> uh, they of course had to design it to, to handle 50 tons. The thing here uh, is that it could uh, possibly handle even more uh, if you were supposed to just transport stuff uh, with it also. So it could have been a 100 ton uh, skidding system if, if uh, necessary. So uh, They have one observation RV and two work RVs. You'll see that that's usually what happens on the uh, IMR vessels, one observation and two work. They have uh, launch and recovery systems for the observation RV and the work RVs. <coughs> Three moon tools for the module handling system and also for ROV operations, which means that they have one moon pool for the module handling system and then they have two moon pools uh, that they use for the ROVs. They have three ROVs, which means that what I'm guessing is that they have one moon pool for each of the work ROVs and then the Observation ROV is uh, borrowing one of the uh, one of the moon pools, uh, so they're lowering it down, um, probably after uh, after the work ROV or in front of the work ROV or something like that. <coughs> uh, they have a hundred ton anchor handling uh, crane, so it's an offshore crane, so uh, they can uh, can pull quite quite huge loads with that. So that's the this one, one hundred ton. Fixed install scale squeeze system. I have no idea what that is, so I'm not <laughs> going to try to interpret it. Uh, so they have uh, catalytic reactors for reducing uh, NOx emissions into air, so uh, nitrous oxide emissions. It's basically the same system as uh, uh, as a diesel engine would have on a on a, v uh, on a car. In in inside the exhaust system, there is a catalyst. Usually, uh, it's uh, aluminium, if I remember correctly. So a catalyst basically means that it's a material that when two other chemical components come into contact with that material, they are going to bond to each other, not to the material. So the material doesn't, doesn't do any of the bonding or anything, but just by being there, it's going to make other chemicals bond uh, to each other. Uh, and it, what it does is that it uh, uh, basically removes quite a lot of the uh, nitrous oxide from uh, from the exhaust, so it makes makes it uh, forces it to to bond with other molecules in the exhaust, so that you get less of it uh, emitted to air, because the nitrous oxide is is uh, a really nasty uh, greenhouse gas. So getting that one away is uh, very nice. Uh, you have. Uh, I think it's like on a, on, a, on a scale of how bad it is for the environment compared to, to uh, carbon dioxide, is I think it's like 100 times worse or something like that. It's really bad. <coughs> uh, in the outside deck area, they have 610 square meters, and the inside they have 650 square meters. So that, uh, the, the total is uh, a little over 1.2 uh, square kilometer. Of deck area, uh, the uh, diving vessel we looked at had one square kilometer, so so it's uh, they have slightly more uh, deck space than the diving vessel we were looking at. Ninety persons, uh, they can have ninety persons on on board. Um, it was one hundred and twenty for the diving vessel, but of course, as we saw with the examples of how much crew you need, uh, you usually don't need ninety persons on an IMR vessel, while a diving vessel can easily end up with over 100. So it's, uh, they, they've uh, made the cabins with regards to what kinds of operations is, are going to be done. Loads of classifications. They have a class two uh, DP system. 
they don't have the O behind there in the uh, DNV uh, system. So DNV was AUT was class one, AUTR class two, and AUTRO is class three. So they <coughs> they only have backup if one of their thrusters or generators or anything uh, anything that's active in in, in the uh, system uh, fails. Then they have backup for that, but if if uh, some of the wiring breaks or a hydraulic hose or anything like that breaks, they don't have a backup system for that. Then they're, then they're going to have to abort the operation and they're going to have to fix the DP system before they can continue. Um <coughs> yeah, and a helideck where they can land a Sikorsky S-92 helicopter on. So it's a fairly large helideck. Can't quite remember with the Sikorskis, but it I think they have room for 16 or 18 people or something like that, so it's a really large helicopter. <coughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's owned by Östensjö Rederi, which is one of the local uh, local uh, shipping uh, companies here, and we have uh, Deep Ocean, which are chartering it basically, built by Arco Yards up north uh, in Norway. We have some IDs and stuff like that. Main engines. They have six main engines. Uh, that's that's gross kilowatts. So two thousand two hundred and thirty gross kilowatts for those six engines. Total of um, thirteen point four megawatts, basically. So, so they're they they have quite a lot of power uh, in their engines. They're diesel electric, uh, so what they do is that they have diesel generators uh, and they are using, uh, uh, generating electric power basically. So they're, they're mostly using electric power uh, on the vessel, but they're using diesel engines to, to, to generate that. <coughs> they have an auxiliary uh, generator also. So, so they, have, they have six main generators they have an auxiliary an, uh, generator and they also have an emergency uh, generator so they have quite a lot of uh, backup systems there uh, basically they have thrusters uh, in the bow and those are azimuth thrusters and in the stern they have azipro i don't really know the difference between the azimuth and the azipro uh, uh, thrusters it has something to do with the design of the thrusters themselves uh, but it's uh, pretty detailed uh, information, so I haven't really gotten a hold of what it is. <coughs> then we have uh, a couple of more stuff there. Main characteristics, just some lengths and sizes. So you can see it's a slightly smaller than the uh, than the diving vessel we were looking at. So almost 110. The diving vessel was 120. <coughs> and uh, it's approximately the same width uh, as it. Um, almost eight meters of maximum drafts. Uh, the minimum draft five point three meters, so it can it can enter uh, as long as you have uh, more than five and a half meters of of uh, depth in your harbor. Uh, it should be possible for this one to enter. So here we actually get service speed and maximum speed. Th that was, they, they were pretty close. So it can run at, it usually runs at 50 knots when it's just uh, at the marching speed when it's traveling. Uh, and the maximum is only 16 and a half, so it's not that much more. So it usually runs at almost full power when it's uh, traveling. Um, I'm not sure if that is fairly normal to a vessel of this size, but I know that uh, for much smaller vessels, you usually have a marching speed that is quite a lot lower than than your maximum speed. Basically, because you you see, uh, you you will see a very clear difference in fuel consumption by using the maximum speed uh, contrary to the to the marching speed. So, uh, but uh, clearly they they don't have that problem on this one. So fuel consumption, a little bit of how much fuel they use each day. They have uh, quite a lot of uh, cargo capacity on uh, deck, so 2,200 tons. And the strength is just like on the uh, diving vessel, so they, they can handle 10 tons per square meter. 
and then they have um, inside and outside the hangar deck, and then the outside area seems to be wooden. So it's actually uh, it's not a steel steel deck uh, on the outside area uh, on this one. So they have actually laid wooden planks on top of of the steel deck. Uh, I'm guessing that has a little bit to do with uh, slipperiness and, and uh, basically the handling of whatever it is that they're placing there. So it's a bit easier to get a bit better friction uh, towards wood, uh, especially when, when it's wet and uh, all of that. So it's probably the reason for that one. Loads of cranes. So we have offshore cranes, we have deck cranes, quite a lot. Then the moon pool. So we have the one moon pool, which is uh, with the module handling system. So we can see how it has a removable bottom hatch because we need to we need to be able to run the module onto the hatch and then lift the module uh, before we remove the hatch and lower it through the moon pool. And then we also uh, have uh, the two work ROV and moon pools. So it doesn't say anything about the observation ROV. Uh, so it might actually be that they lower the observation ROV over the side of the ship instead of using a moon pool. I'm uh, not quite sure how they do that. So they have uh, some extra winches in order to uh, control whatever it is they're lifting. And of course the helicopter deck. Quite a lot of... Uh, Tank capacities, ballast, freshwater, liquid mud, base oil. So they have a very uh, specialized information uh, that we won't really bother much with. <coughs> Mess room, so they have room for 48 of their crew. So they could handle 90 uh, of their crew, but only half of them can go to eat uh, at one time. So uh, or at least sit down and eat uh, at one time. But usually you, you will always have one shift working and usually you have, uh, uh, if you're running 12 hour shifts, you will have half of the crew working, half of the crew uh, eating and sleeping. Um, and if you're running three shifts, you will have uh, one third of the crew working, one third sleeping and one third eating. So it's never going to be a problem that they only have 48 seats in their mess. They don't, don't really need anything more than that. <coughs> Recreation rooms. A cinema with 30 seats, so that's nice. That's uh, practically like a cruise ship. <laughs> when you have, <laughs> they usually always have uh, cinemas. TV lounges, smoker lounge, library even, uh, internet cafe, fitness room. So uh, they're doing what they can to to keep their uh, keep their crew happy while they're while they're at work. So <coughs> they have uh, quite a lot of offices, workshops, ROV workshops. Here's, a, here's one I, I don't know what means. So they have an engine workshop that's below tween deck. I have no idea what a tween deck is. I'm not, I'm not familiar enough with uh, ships to, uh, to be able to say what that is. So if, uh, if anyone figures it out, uh, please feel free to share it with me <laughs> so that I can figure it out also. <laughs> Total number of bunks, 90. They had a 90 crew capacity. But they only have 65 cabins, so some of the cabins are, uh, are double. Uh, so 26 are two-man cabins. So they have mess rooms and recreation rooms, seven of those, and one hospital, actually. So uh, that, that's usually pretty important to have on a, on a vessel of that size, to have somewhere, if something happens, you have some uh, medical capabilities uh, to, to handle it. They have lots of radar, autopilots, GPS systems, echo sounders, gyroscopes, um, radio installation, satellite. DP system is over here, so we've talked a bit about DP system. So they, they are also using a Kongsberg uh, system. <coughs> and here it actually says that it's it says DP2 there, but it says AUTRO with the DMU on. Oh, it's probably a typo in the, in, in the data sheet. We have uh, taut wires, motion reference units, wind sensors, various systems over here, anti-healing, anti-roll. They have an incinerator on board and the module handling system, which has 
maximum hook travel of 2,000 meters, so they can lower it down to a depth of two kilometers. So they can't go any deeper than that. They don't have enough wire, basically, to, uh, to lower it. And the uh, uh, module handling system has active heat compensation. And it also has uh, up to three guide wires that can be used. Uh, they can uh, be working uh, pulling with a five ton uh, capacity. Uh, and even the guide wires have active heat compensation. So it's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good system that they have. Yeah, we have some uh, illustrations of how the ship has been built. Basically doing deck by deck down here uh, until we get into the uh, inner parts of the ship. And you can see it's, it's pretty, it's not all that wide compared to how tall it is. So we've got the sea line uh, surface of the ocean around there. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty compact stuff really when you start looking at it. <coughs> So we also get it seen from the side with the crane here and everything. The water line will be uh, around here so that you get this tip sticking uh, slightly up of the water when it's uh, just staying still. When it's moving forwards, uh, this tip type here serves to sort of, I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but uh, uh, it sort of spreads the water a little bit so that it uh, it reduces the the drag resistance in the water by, uh, by having that that shape there. <coughs> there's another one, the Fugro Discovery, which is a uh, survey vessel. Yeah, a survey vessel, hydrographic and geophysical survey vessel. So they use it to let's see. Uh, yeah, they basically use it all over the world was originally purpose-built for the Norwegian Navy, but has been uh, then sold by the Navy to uh, the Fugro company who have converted it to a multi-role survey ship. <coughs> so from, it was built in 1997. I'm guessing built there means that it was uh, retrofitted in 1997, so that was when they bought it and, and built it to become a, a survey vessel. So it, uh, it was probably originally built way before that, again, uh, for the uh, Norwegian Navy. And they can do ROV inspection, uh, pipeline, cable surveys, high resolution seismic acquisition surveys, geotechnical and environmental surveys. So it has quite a lot of stuff it can do. <coughs> Auto positioning system, so basically a, a DP system. Uh, modern analog digital geophysical equipment. And they have a an A-frame uh, that can lift 16 tons. So that's the A-frame uh, in the back here. <coughs> so what they do is uh, not only do they run pipeline surveys with, with the ROV, with the survey RV that's uh, on board, but they also use uh, use uh, use it to to do geomet geotechnical and environmental surveys. So so basically just mapping the ocean floor, and you don't necessarily have to use the uh, the RV in order to map the ocean floor. It depends on how deep it is. Uh, if it's uh, really deep, you're going to have to use an RV uh, in order to get get your signals uh, straight. But if you're just talking about a couple of hundred meters of, of depth, it is fully possible to just run the ship uh, and do all of the survey stuff uh, from the ship itself. So it's going to reach all of the sea floor and it's going to get good signal from it. So uh, here's one of the uh, one of the images that they've created from the ocean floor. <coughs> you can see it has the A-frame with the crane. 16 tons. Try to uh, single out stuff that is uh, familiar to us here uh, that we've uh, looked at before. So <laughs> in their accommodations, they have 12 single cabins, one double one, and they have one bed in their hospital. 
so they can only handle one serious uh, injury or sickness uh, before they basically need to start using uh, using uh, cabins in order to do it. <coughs> so here they only have uh, two rooms, which are lounges or video rooms, and one one fitness center, basically a gym. <coughs> so they're using uh, three generators for electrical power. Quite a lot of fuel capacity they have. Uh, that's normal for a, for a vessel like this because usually they do pretty uh, pretty long operations. So uh, so they need to be able to run on uh, quite a lot of fuel. They have a uh, Simrad DP system. Uh, so that's a Kongsberg uh, Simrad. Sanders multi beams, they have a whole lot of survey equipment as you can see here. Uh, even a hydrophone, so it's basically just a microphone that you put into the water so you can listen to uh, whatever's going on. <coughs> Seismic recording systems, even so, quite a lot of things uh, they can do. Then we have uh, Deep Blue, which is a pipe laying vessel. Now you can see it uh, has the, uh, has the uh, vertical drum roll for, for the uh, for the cables and stuff. So we get to see it a bit better from the side here. See everything it does. And it has moon pools where it's where it's lowering the the uh, cables to it. Okay, different pipes. Yeah. Uh, it's able to combine the installation of all types of flexible and rigid risers, flow lines and umbilicals. So it can support developments in water depths up to 3,000 meters. So it's um, a pretty, uh, pretty versatile vessel. It can do almost basically all of the uh, tasks that need to be done uh, with, with regards to laying pipes and uh, cables, and uh, even all the way down to 3,000 meters. So it's a, it's a uh, pretty good one uh, to use. There we have a couple of pictures of it. Uh, in uh, Mobile, Alabama, and uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So here also we have almost too much information. That's always a problem with these data sheets, just trying to locate the information that you need uh, fr from the data sheet compared to, compared to all that is uh, available there. <coughs> so craneage and deck winches goes up here again. So they have 40... Smaller utility cranes ranging from 10 to 40 tons. 327 ton traction and storage winch. So that's uh, probably for one of the pipe laying stuff. 150 ton initiation winch. So probably just do uh, initiation of pipelines using uh, primarily suction piles, diverless uh, latch and pipe transfer. Okay, so it's uh, basically when they're starting to lay their pipeline. They need uh, the 150 ton winch, so that's when they use that one. They have a 50 ton fast winch for light loads, and they have a 550 ton pipe hollower, as it's called. A <coughs> couple of more pictures from uh, the vessel. And some more information. Let's see if there was anything uh, relevant to us here. Even more pictures. Maximum water depth, 3,000 meters. And it's a little bit about the work table over the moon pools, the JLA systems, everything like that. Here we can see sort of how the crane booms can reach over the sides. So that's uh, nice to see. So you can see this one actually has 32 almost 33 meters of reach with on, on that crane, 18 meters on that crane, 55 meters on that one. So it can reach quite far to the sides. And here we even have uh, dynamic positioning footprints uh, for it. So, so you can see uh, basically the same as we were looking at uh, in the previous uh, lecture with the DP systems. And some more information, and that was the last one. So then we'll do 
we'll do uh, the uh, appendix B for our next our next lecture next week.